Hi, I'm Gabby Logan, the host of today's NatWest In Conversation With, and I'm delighted to tell you that my guest today is Owen Morgan. And we're going to be discussing leadership, managing change, and why establishing a strong team and keeping morale high is a key to success. Hi, Owen. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, we recently had a baby boy before the lockdown period, so it's been pretty awesome. It's our first ch child and loads of different challenges, loads of different feelings, loads of different emotions, and we've loved every minute of it. Amazing. Tell us a bit about the training. You mentioned the four months that you had, which must have been wonderful to bond as a family unit, but presumably at that point, you just had to keep ticking over in some way with your fitness. Yeah, our strength and conditioning, head of strength and conditioning went into a bit of a meltdown, trying to figure out who had a gym at home and what facilities they had, and not a lot of guys do. So it was a, a matter of trying to get as much equipment out of gyms and, and deliver it to, to people's homes. I think a lot of people chose a bike for their cardio. I know I did, um, and I've absolutely loved it, uh, along with some other weights. But the, the, the big thing for us... Um, was we, we didn't know how long we were going into lockdown and considering that we spend a lot of time away from home as it is away from family and friends and on the road we thought it was best for our players to try and enjoy those first couple of months as much as they can um, they haven't had it for a very very long time um, so just as part of their well-being I think if, if they were stressing out about trying to stay fit for four months and then going into competitive sport they would burn out quite quickly mentally. Um, so from that side of things, things have worked really well. Guys bought into that. And then the extra two months at the end was tagged on to try and keep physically fit um, as well as mentally. Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, let's, let's go back to your, your whole career is so interesting because of where you came from. You know, Ireland obviously wasn't playing uh, top class cricket at the point that you were a child and growing up there. So when did it come to mind that you could be a cricketer with all the other sports that were no doubt vying for your attention in Ireland? Yeah, it's an interesting one, actually, because as a, as a young kid, I played every sport um, growing up. I grew up in a big family and um, I had five other siblings and they all played sport. But the number one sport in the household was always cricket. My two sisters played cricket for Ireland. My three brothers all played some sort of representative cricket growing up. And it was quite a family affair when it came to the weekends and, and Saturday mornings, kids' time and, and under 11s, 12s, 15s cricket. And then in the afternoon, my dad would play. And when my older brothers were old enough, they'd play in the same team as him. So we'd all congregate at the cricket club and that would be most of our weekends. So it's quite special in that regard. Um, but I, I probably didn't realise that I had the potential that I did until I was about 12 or 13. And it was my dad that actually started asking me what I wanted to do with cricket. It's, everything was quite consuming. And there were certain opportunities that I would have to, um, I suppose, sacrifice in order to focus on cricket itself. Because I played um, football, Gaelic football, hurling a little bit of rugby at the time as well. Um, you, did you so, go to school at all? Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you came to school in England for a while, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So I was, um, I was 14 when we explored um, some scholarship opportunities, uh, one at Dulwich College when I came over for a, a term to see what it was like and, and go through the experience and then possibly take advantage of a cricket scholarship there. And when I, I can remember arriving and just been blown away by the, the enormity of the school and the facilities that were on show for, for everybody. Um, and I, I, I loved my time there, but it wasn't the same as playing cricket at your local club with your family. There was that element that was just completely missing. So, um, so I ended up going to school in, in the centre of Dublin, actually, to a, a school called Catholic University School that wasn't massively renowned for its sporting um, expertise but it had a really good cricket team and a really good head cricket coach uh, in which I could go and, and learn as much as I could so I took that opportunity and, and with that came opportunities to go on exchange to a school in South Africa when I was 16 to expand my cricket again um, which was just it is priceless when you can travel and do what you do as a kid is is absolutely priceless so experiences like that certainly helped me along the way to the position that I'm in at the moment. There was a, uh, you sound like you had the, the perfect kind of balance of a really 
interested family you know the sport was really important and supportive a school obviously where they were helping you progress and and your own desire you know it has to come from you doesn't it to, to be able to go out 16 across the other side of the world so when the opportunity came to play cricket for a living you presumably just you grabbed that with both hands oh i jumped at it i jumped at it i think i think the first visual that I, I, I saw of, of playing cricket as a living was when I, when I came to Dulwich. Uh, we played against a lot of county players that were a lot older than me that had county contracts or rookie contracts or academy contracts. And I remember coming back thinking, wow, that's, that's amazing. You know, is there another pathway into doing that? If the opportunity came about, how would I do it? And I remember my dad asking me when I came back, what do you want to play for England? How does, how does that look? And I remember saying, yeah. And, and was it okay to say that being an Irishman was it all right because obviously the, there was huge disparity between the standards of the two teams yeah in my eyes it was um in in a lot of other people's eyes I, I don't think it was to, to say it at such a young age and have I suppose the drive to want to do that and, and and I suppose the direction in knowing where you want to be I suppose a lot of people are jealous a lot of people go through meander throughout their lives don't know what they want to do but this young, cocky, ambitious kid comes along and says he wants to do something. I'm sure a lot of people were unhappy about it. So you, you get the career that you've craved and clearly are displaying leadership possibilities and, you know, have this the captaincy eventually, obviously, of captaining England. So tell me where that kind of grew. Were you always a leader? Did you always have the ability to make those decisions under pressure? Yeah, I think unknowingly I did. I, I captained, I played Ireland age group all the way through. I played south of England uh, on the 17s, on the 19s. Um, I played Middlesex on the 15s, 17s, 19s, second team, first team. And I've captained every team that I've played in along the way. So maybe unknowingly, um, I did have some qualities that, that I, uh, I wasn't consciously trying to impart on people, but maybe that somebody thought along the way might add some value to the rest of the team. Somebody must have spotted that. I always, it fascinates me when you see kids kind of playing any sport that somebody sees that, don't they? And they nurture it in somebody. So what kind of leader were you? You somebody who feels you lead by example or has your, has the vocal side of your leadership grown as, as you've grown? Yeah, I think it's always a difficult question to ask for any type of leader, but the one thing I am, is authentic. I am my own type of leader. I'm not always outspoken. I speak about things that I believe in, truths. I'm very honest in where I need to go or we need to go as a team, regardless of performance or results. And I think that's a really good place to be. And people respect you for that. You're not just because it's consistency. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's something that you can gauge, um, sometimes out of performance because a lot of it can do with the preparation and how guys are prepared for games or, or their training ethic is um, good or bad or, or needs a little bit of work. Um, so I think, yeah, authentic is, is the word that I would use that would describe my captaincy. And leading by example, behaving in a way that you expect others around you to behave brings its own pressure, doesn't it? So do you feel a pressure to be perennially positive and kind of upbeat and optimistic no i don't but i, I think naturally as a leader you always see uh, an opportunity or a light at the end of a tunnel or a way out because in practicality you are a problem solver so you always need to see an answer to something um, and you find yourself being able to do that in situations of games where people think they're dead and buried and you need to believe because you see the opportunity. So you need to be able to make that opportunity transparent and clear and map out how you're going to get there in order for people to, to believe it. And I think along that uh, road of, of seeing the plan and, and believing it, you need to be able to listen to, to see if people are following the plan, make sure, making sure they're on the line if they're not. Um, but also the, the powerful thing is them getting them to buy into it as well clear messaging obviously and being you know clear in the way you want people to to operate that is okay if you're sitting on the sidelines when you're in the midst of that battle that heated sporting encounter keeping your head clear sometimes must be the biggest challenge i suppose as a young professional cricketer at middlesex and um, between the ages of 18 to 21 i actually failed quite a lot and there was a lot of disappointment and a lot of heartbreak 
in my early years. And I sort of sat back at the end of, I think it was my final first contract, final year of my first contract that I signed and tried to understand what would work for me because what I was doing wasn't working and I was desperate to do well. So I sort of taught myself to engage in the now, which in cricket is actually easy to do because at every ground up and down the country, you have this huge big scoreboard with a load of numbers and a load of detail. So you can engage in what is actually happening as opposed to what you feel or what you think is happening. So that's what I do to, till from then until this day. That's, a, uh, I suppose, a, a tool that I use to always bring me back to what is happening in the game and what needs to, to happen moving forward. So in a way, you stripped away the emotional part of your character that was causing you problems and kept it very almost linear. You're, you, the score, what needs to happen, which sounds, you know, that's like, it's almost textbook. Like this is what you need to do, but actually putting that into practice, what, what were your, you know, give some tips to somebody who's thinking that is exactly what I need to do. I need to take away the emotion out of my decision making. Yeah, I think, I think the first step in that is actually recognising when your emotion is taking over and when you need to use the score, whatever you, you're doing, if it is a scoreboard, so I use it all the time. So in, in recent games where we played a first international T20 against Australia, the game was getting away from us. And it's, if the emotion is being, I suppose, overcoming somebody, you just give up. You're thinking you, you're just going to lose. That's, that's what happens. Australia are a good side. We'll hopefully win the next game. Um, and I think we got to a stage where Australia needed 36 off 34 balls with seven wickets in hand. So they should win that game nine times out of 10. Um, but in my head, I'm thinking I'm watching it come down the whole time and I'm trying to figure out who's in next. Um, so I thought it was Maxwell's in next. Okay, Maxwell. So if we take a wicket this over, we'll bring Joffre on. Then Joffre is a good matchup to Maxwell. And then that can make inroads from there. And then they're two wickets down and that soaks up an extra three balls. So they go from needing 36 off 35 or 34 to off 30. And then that takes down another over. And then you sort of see a picture of how it might unfold. So it's being very clear in your thought process, relaying that to those around you. And you've mentioned it a couple of times, actually, which I think is really important, is being allowed to make mistakes. And you yourself talked about that in your own career, but, but allowing your colleagues as well that space to learn from their mistakes. Yeah, I think it's huge. Uh, we've, we've managed to create an environment where making mistakes is, is a good thing. And I think as long as you have guys that are willing to learn from those mistakes, it can be extremely productive. How important for you is it then that there's no room for people who are a bit too maverick? Or can you, can you handle? Because in every business and every environment, there's always somebody that just wants to test things a little bit further wants to push the envelope or push the boundaries yeah there is and we still have mavericks in our team um they love being named as well so um, guys like johnny Bairstow and jason roy are, are two of our biggest mavericks they're exceptional in what they do um and i think in in with their contributions to the team at no stage have they ever sacrificed the end goal which is the team goal um, for their own personal gain. And I think uh, to hold Mavericks accountable is, is extremely important. Yeah, not losing what it is that makes them so brilliant and game-changing. No, that's the, that's the lie. You take the spirit out of them then. It's yeah. not fun. And, and to be honest, captaincy would be easy if you did. Um, you, you'd be dealing with the same people all the time. A lot of robots. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of robots. Whereas actually we've had a lot of different characters in our, in our team. Um, that, that are managed in different ways. And I think it, it's great because it makes, it makes your life and your job more interesting than, than like I said, it would be. It's, it's okay saying to somebody, we've well, got to build a really good team morale, but that's, it's almost like it's a noble thing. You don't go buy it off a shelf, do you? So clearly to win a World Cup, you have to have a great team morale. You have to have belief. How does it come about? How do you build it? Yeah, I think a lot of building team culture, team morale is dependent on empowering the players to, to buy into something. And as a sportsman, when you hear about potentially buying into something within a team that sits outside of performance or accountability on the field, actually people jump towards that. So what we've done over the last four years is try to empower guys um, to engage a lot more with 
interests outside of cricket that people are, are involved in. And over the period of time and the length that we've played together, I think our journey has naturally created that culture and um, I suppose that morale that, that you're talking about. Mm. And friendships, which don't necessarily kind of always work away from that environment, but you have to, whether you, you know, let's call it trust or just that reliance that you have to have when you're going in to a sporting arena like that. I think trust is a massive thing. I think um, as a sportsman or as, a, as somebody who performs um, on a stage majority of the time, you find yourself being vulnerable a lot. And when you, when you are vulnerable, obviously you're exposed and you fail a lot. So um, you need to have a lot of people around you that you trust in order to be able to get back on the horse, try again, try and learn, uh, encouraged um, and feel a part of the team. So in terms of tips for building a culture, a winning culture in any environment, trust would be at the heart of that. Yeah, I, I try to keep winning out of it. And uh, we came up with three words that uh, resonated with all of our players in all three formats, which is actually quite rare. Um, so we talked about, um, in, a, in every sport you get a shirt and everybody talks about the shirt and the badge. Whereas actually in, in cricket, you get a cap at the very beginning of your journey is presented to you um, on your debut, more than, likely like a, by a, more than likely by a past player or a player that you admire. And it's the one thing that you hold on to the whole time throughout your journey from start to finish. So we talked about um, taking the cap forward and leaving it in a better place than when we first received it and using our badge, the three lions and the crown as symbolizing uh, taking the cap forward and the three words, the three values that we adhere to are courage, respect and unity. And everybody has a story somewhere along the line outside of cricket where they've all, all displayed these values. Um, which guys have, have enjoyed buying into. And how important is it to you that this is a team that's been praised for its diversity and being ethnically diverse and very inclusive as well? I think it's extremely important. It's not something that's obviously consciously happened. It's been very authentic to the team that we are. We are a group of guys that I can now say after playing in the World Cup and traveling up and down the country and watching our fans um, flock into stadiums that we are a true reflection of what modern England looks like. And why, particularly with COVID, do you think it's it's kind of even more important that you can bring some light and happiness and relief to people? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I've, I've said this a, a lot before. Um, you know, we play cricket all year round, all over the world, and. Um, people come to sports grounds at any given time to, to watch us or we'll be on the TV. But there's actually very rare occasion when people need you. And I found myself coming towards the end of, of the lockdown really needing sport. Not to play it, just to watch it. Watch it on TV, have something to follow. Because it's such a big part of my life and I think a big part of everybody's life. So in a, in a way that you, you, the adversity that we're all feeling right now and the uncertainty um, can actually be some, some way that you can, you can help. Yeah, well, I, I hope it can or, or continue to be. Certainly the feedback we've had from games that we've played so far has, has been brilliant. We, we certainly have a lot more people watching cricket now than, than we did last year. And the drive and the passion is, is, is as high as ever. So you don't strike me as somebody who finds it difficult to switch off because you've mentioned a couple of times as well about the culture in the team room, being able to talk about things other than cricket. Are, are you quite good at saying, right, that's, that's finished for the day? Yes, I am. Um, and I've only become sort of better at that through practice. And receiving criticism or a critique um, is, is very important in, in sport, in any, any sportsman, but it also in life, we have to learn to receive criticism. I think sports people are particularly good at receiving criticism compared to say, you know, kind of people out of that hard arena. Are you somebody who naturally took that or was that something else that you had to learn? No, I think I've always 
trusted certain people to talk to, even going back to the, the very beginning of my career, I think I missed some really good advice from some coaches because I didn't trust them along the way. Um, and then throughout my career, particularly playing international cricket, I've always, I suppose, blocked out a certain amount of the noise and gone on with my life, um, which has worked well in some instances, but in others, it hasn't. So I think I've learned to, to, to notice when it's good information and bad information and actually dump the, the bad stuff pretty quickly. That fearlessness that seemed to kind of prevail through the team has been much admired. And fearlessness is something that, you know, I don't know if you can even begin to kind of create that. But, but that's, again, I think goes back to trust, doesn't it? Do you, do you recognise that growing, that fearlessness when you're in that environment? No, absolutely. I think, and I suppose the end product that you see is the, is the performance, but that's built from the, the culture values, uh, the elements of trust within the team, outside of performance, and then levels of trust in training, building that up, recognising what guys are doing, how hard they're working, the level of intensity that they're operating at. And that, that comes together and it grows. It just doesn't stop. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the important ones for us was about a year out from the World Cup, we became number one in the world. And uh, not a lot of us knew if we won the series that we did, we would become number one. And we sat down and spoke about it after. And, and the main question was, how does that change what we're trying to do? And the, <laughs> the overwhelming answer was, it doesn't. We weren't trying to be number one, we're trying to win the World Cup. That's just a product of what we've achieved so far. It's a nice pat on the back, but continuing to our main goal is what we want to do. And you're the ones that everybody wants to shoot down. When you're, when you're at the bottom and you're kind of building yourselves up, nobody expects, do they? They're not sure what to expect. Now they can see the kind of outfit you are and you're an amazing scalp for, for any first-class cricket team, aren't you? They want, they want you. I think it's great. It's, I'd far better be, rather be in this position than being ranked number six in the world and nobody has any hope nobody for you. Rate you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'd much rather be number one in the world, World Cup champions, and going into a World Cup as the team that nobody wants to play against. Can you think back to a time for us and a moment where you experienced failure on or off the pitch and what you learned from that process, like an, an actual example of something that hurt? Yeah, loads. Absolutely loads. I make mistakes all the time and they can be overlooked uh, depending on whether you win or lose. Um, but certainly I'm trying to learn as a captain, as a leader all the time. And one of the things that I've improved on in the last two and a half years is taking time when time is needed at the end of a bowler's mark. So the bowler is, um, has a ball in his hand, he runs in, bowls a ball, bowls a bad ball and you want to communicate to the guy, or he's bowled a good ball, but you still want to have that open line of communication. And when you get to the latter stages of a game, what you want to do is take time out. Make sure the guy's responsive to what you're saying. You're getting clear answers back. Or if he's not a guy who likes talking, you just want, you want to have the ball in your hand. Don't give it to him. Hold on. Just give him time to breathe. Take everything in. Make sure he knows what he's doing and go again. Now, in 2016, the T20 World Cup final in India, Ben Stokes uh, was hit for four sixes by Carlos Brathwaite and we lost the World Cup final in a, in a situation where we, we'd win nine times out of ten. Now, the four times, the four sixes that he was hit for every time I ran over to Ben, talked to him about what he was trying to do. He had the ball in his hand the whole time. I ran to Ben. So in what I thought I was taking 15 to 20 seconds out, I was actually only there for three and ran back for two. So it was five seconds. If you watch the Joffre Archer super over where I ran to him every ball, took my time, held the ball the majority of the time, or the last four series that we've played since then, I stand beside the bowler a hell of a lot, trying to take time out of the game, make sure he's breathing, make sure his heart rate is down. Make sure he's, he's confident and wants to commit to the plan that we've agreed to commit to. Um, it's certainly seen as benefits because we've played in so many close games since then. Australia the other day, we played a super over down in New Zealand where it was extremely useful. Um, 
who played a real close game in Durban against South Africa where Tom Curran saw us over the line. Um, and I think in moments like that, sort of having gone through the experience with Ben and knowing that I could have helped him more, you know, that hurts a lot. Um, when but you, you learn from that, obviously. Absolutely. And you put Absolutely. it into play yeah. on the biggest stage of all and you yeah. were able to, to rectify and correct that. Did, was that a decision and a realisation that came from within or other people around you who, who pointed that out? No, that's, that's from myself. Um, I don't think a lot of other people would have pointed it out because obviously a lot of people point the finger at Ben, which is, which is wrong. Um, but I think if you're honestly looking at your performance as a leader, which you should do uh, on, a, on a regular basis, um, you have to be willing to take feedback. But I think, I think I'm quite harsh on myself anyway and sometimes like, take in too much and, and I'm quite critical. Um, but certainly that's one thing that's it's not only benefited me, but I think it's actually had quite a, a positive effect on that person. What about people close to you, though, who help you navigate the tough times? Would that be family or other people within the setup that you would turn to? Yeah, um, I'm really close with my eldest sister. Um, she's always been a, a mentor of mine. Um, she, she played amateur sport uh, as a kid, still plays uh, cricket and um, is quite successful in her own right in, in business. And she's somebody, somebody that I learn a, a huge amount from that if I ever notice that I'm sort of straying away from being Owen Morgan, the person that I am normally, um, I'll call her and speak to her or just on a, on a regular basis, I'll, I'll speak to her about different things and different aspects or uh, because she's always trying to improve her leadership and, and so am I. So different things, different podcasts, different books um, that we've been reading, we always sort of soundboard them off each other, which is quite cool. Can your sister pretty much tell you anything, Owen? Could she keep you, your feet firmly on the ground then? Absolutely. No, she, she, she sent me a photo the other day. I reviewed an LBW that hit the middle of the bat. And she sent me a photo and said, good day, question mark. So I was like, <laughs> she keeps you quite level. <laughs> she sounds like she's got the measure of you. It's always, it's always good to have those people around you though, isn't it? And to, and to know when they tell you the good stuff, you have to believe it. And when they tell you the bad stuff, you have to believe it. Absolutely. Totally agree. Well, hopefully it's more and more of the good stuff because uh, things are going very well at the moment, even in these very challenging times. And we've said about how important sport is. So uh, keep enjoying the rest of this slightly strange season. And um, we look forward to a time when we can all come and, uh, and cheer your team on. Thanks, Abby. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen. It's been great to chat. Thank you. Thank you.